And <laughs> right. Um, so Mike Innes, um, founder of what is now LSI Architects, um, a 90 year old architect with a huge amount of life and practice experience. Um, and as a sort of educator, an all round good egg who's been involved in Norwich and Norfolk over the past decades, really. So um, we're going to, rather than giving a lecture, this is going to be similar to uh, sort of Wednesday forum events. So we'll, we'll start, we'll kick off, we'll have about half an hour of conversation and then we'll open up to Q&A because I think that one thing that people have missed um, is an opportunity to sort of get involved and get debate going. So um, Mike, thank you very much. And over to you. Uh, in terms of formats, Mike said that he uh, would like to open with a, uh, a throat clearing statement. So um, yeah, over to you, Mike. My daughter says I can never do anything without clearing my throat. So here it goes and get that over. Uh, just a brief note, I was born in 31, so I'm kind of getting on. And I, with, in 1940, I was sleeping nine years old in an air raid shelter, my father, a petty officer, uh, and absent for most of the rest of the war, north of Murmansk, uh, living in the largest naval base in Europe, Devonport, uh, being blitzed to perdition. A couple of years of this, followed by a couple of years evacuated, and then on my way to national service and so on. After V and VJ days, a teenager learning alongside mature and optimistic World War II returnees. I was born into professional life with the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, which uh, for the time that's elapsed since, seems to me has gone progressively downhill after a first uh, braver start. I feel like Rip Van Winkle. I've been over the hill, not paying full attention for a short while now. I've returned older, and what do I find? The pace of things certainly slowed for me, but quickened for the climate. And it was some long while ago, it had already crested a safe place at the top of its hill. Buckminster Fuller published a diagram. Lots of people said things, but uh, his uh, diagram uh, shows that from 1740 on, uh, the technical Western world started a really precipitous increase in uh, the gradient year on year. And uh, here we are where we are now. I'm terrified. Times of alarm and emergency, fire and flooding, faster uh, melting ice in Iceland, in uh, inland oceanic and polar waters, and so on. Papers are full of it every day. Uh, we have capital somehow always getting eroded without being properly dedicated to doing something to steady this situation. Um, Capital is put out of reach by the money men. Uh, and uh, what's the consequence? Did you? No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. This is te technically learning. Governments continue as before, uh, but they have fragmented new policies and if you look in the housing field, it's been boring me. Uh, 300 million houses needed every year uh, without ever specifying as to who needs them. Now, we know there are 300 million people who need houses, but they're not being built for those people year on year and haven't been since Thatcher, to put it crudely. I expect I can be criticized for an inaccuracy in timing there. But, uh, Architects have always, within my experience, when working in a local context, had a respect for their place. And I've always argued for local architects in 
these out of London situations. And I think that utopia is a decent aim uh, for everybody. And uh, yet it's become a kind of sneer word by people who don't think we should be spending money in ways other than what they want. But before we can decide to do anything, I think we need a new way of governance. If you look at today's paper, the headline of today's paper is what it is. <laughs> and if you look at the sun, yeah. uh, for those who can't see, uh, global heating is on track to top 2.4 degrees uh, despite COP26 pledges. And the subtext on the uh, the, the, bi the, the secondary article? Uh, the next one is uh, questions over Ian Duncan Smith's £25,000 a year second job. And that's a small thing compared to some of the second jobs we've seen. We, we know that there is that... Uh, uh, the House of Lords gets bigger and bigger because it builds capital at the rate of uh, a few hundred million a year by the look of it. Don't want to deal with those things, uh, just note them because they're part of the rot that's set in. And out of the climate summit has not come the hugely uh, necessary things that we need to come. Uh, I would like to start the real purpose of this talk. Right. And just ask your attention for a minute. And it's not the only one, is it? It's just a very good shot that I recorded from the BBC things some uh, years ago now. But we waste tremendous amounts of money. And it's never considered a waste of money when certain people wish to do it, whether it is flying into space or whether it's building the wrong sort of buildings. Uh, it can be done better. And Architects know how to do it better, but what's the position of architects? Um, in a professional sense, they're not where they were, nor are any of the other professions, which is again what terrifies me a bit really, because as we head towards an online society, the chances of, of getting something put in a better frame of mind and put right get harder and harder to find. We're lucky here in Thorpe, in Norwich, we have a town council, which is a, a, a reintroduction really, uh, after the 1973, 74 uh, local government reforms. Um, and we do know our town council here a bit, and they do do things locally, arrange events for us and so on and so forth. The nearer you get, to the customer, as it were, on the whole, the more likely you are to get an honest feedback. But what are we trying to do now is a question none of us can answer. That we are sure about. Everything that does go on in the way we all used to go on, we know at the moment is likely to need correcting. And that's what I think should be our focus. I came across the fact that uh, in, nine, in 2010, uh, I, the Norfolk Association of Architects responded uh, to uh, a request of mine when I, for the second time, was president then of the local Association of Architects to produce a pamphlet called Do Different and Do Better. Uh, debating Norfolk's future. 
I don't want to discuss that now. I don't think we should be discussing those kind of, we should be talking about them, but we should not be, as it were, settling them. And it worries me that they're out to consultation on different ways of developing Norfolk at the moment with their new planning policy uh, that is a proposal and is out for consultation. How do we deal with it? We don't know what transport is doing. We don't know what very much is doing. I do admire the way the transport, the bus, the public transport situation has been got together in a rather better way. And no doubt it will continue to improve. Um, but that publication is on my website, which is incomplete uh, and faltering a bit, but you can get it. If you look at Michael Innes Architect, that's me, and we'll circulate that with the copies of the video. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's going to be a sort of open um, yeah, format in terms of this evening. So anything that's mentioned, we can circulate a reading list or copies of uh, images or reports or anything that's mentioned. So we can, yeah, we can share that info. I also, uh, produced a pamphlet um, in 2012 called Homes Fit for Purpose, based on those ideas. I think that hasn't reached the website yet, but it will. So there's a bit more uh, to pick up there. In passing, we are also talking about crises in the National Health Service and hospitals. Again, I don't wish to talk about it now, but when on the Council of the Norfolk Association of Architects, uh, along with others, not on our own, uh, we produced another uh, publication uh, about a different way of doing the hospital, which made the, demo, uh, the transformation of the existing Norfolk and Norwich Hospital unnecessary but they went on to build the new hospital at Colney. And that was a dishonest thing to do, in my view, politically, because it was only ever publicized as a second hospital. And that was at the time of Tony Blair's first accession. And Charles Clark, whom uh, we wished at that time uh, to send to Westminster, some of us, um, because he supported the ideas for not getting rid of the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital, promised to rectify that when he got to Westminster, and he never did. Uh, so uh, they built Colney, first of all, too small, and had to enlarge it in its first year. And it was a hideously expensive throwaway um, to bin uh, the old hospital, which was absolutely up to date, if a bit sort of here and there in places, but perfectly capable of, of improvement and had, uh, I think it was uh, five operating theatres, three of which had never been used. An example of waste of money. Now that brings me to my second theme, which has always been a function of my position as an archi architect, and that is um, that you should look at not just the cost of a building, you should look at its total cost. Holistically, you should look at what it costs to run, what it costs to finance, de da de da de da don't need to bang on about that. Can we now move on um, to talk about energy, um, again, in passing, uh, because of cost again. Why did we build so many wind towers is a valid question to ask. They've been built by the thousands. Why did we never investigate tidal properly? There was a very good uh, paper and book written by an engineer uh, some time ago now called David J.C. McKay and uh, I don't pretend to be an expert, 
he doesn't say it's all absolutely clear cut, but we must be the most obvious candidate for tidal energy. And I don't just mean the old seven estuary, but the wash, and he nominates several possibilities. Shouldn't we be looking at that? Isn't this another reason we shouldn't be spending many, many millions on things that may not be in the right direction? Because I don't know if it's true or not, um, but I'm told that the energy consumed in producing these thousands upon thousands of wind farms on land and offshore even more, um, that is going the wrong way, possibly, possibly. And is it going the wrong way because enough people want to make money out of it, just as enough people want to make money out of oil and coal still? I think you have to ask the question. Now, I want to talk about the way we might, several ways we might think about uh, building uh, as architects, if we're still in the market in the future. And we can't talk about that at the moment too, too clearly, um, but um, do people remember, uh, do, do, do people remember this thing? End of suburban man, uh, which is the thing that followed outrage. Uh, I read it very avidly at the time, uh, and it <coughs> led me to think that we should not be uh, dealing with our cities in the way we are. But that wasn't the only thing. Um, at a time when uh, certain people were fashionable, uh, Corbusier, I was a great admirer of Corbusier uh, and uh, his Unité d'Habitation, uh, the one in Marseille and the one uh, in non -Rose. Um, and the very good buildings. It's interesting, like a number of other major works of that sort, that they, they worked well, but they got privatized, as did the tower in Paddington. Um, and uh, I, I'm very interested in that, uh, because when Chris Lambert, who was uh, my partner, uh, I was his partner, the right way to put it, he was senior partner, I joined him that way around. But when Chris and I went to Paddington uh, to look at the tower, because uh, um, Buckman, uh, what was he called? Uh, Goldfinger? Goldfinger. He wanted us to take him over uh, because he was getting on. <laughs> and we visited him in his office on the ground floor of that block, and he was enormously defensive about it uh, because he loved it, and he insisted, didn't give us the choice, he's that kind of guy, he insisted on taking us to any floor we wanted, knock on any door you want, and ask the tenant how they go on, and then he did that to two or three floors, uh, and then we got back and discussed the question of how it would go on with him because it was a bit notorious, getting a bit notorious at the time. And uh, he uh, was very hurt by this. He, he had kept his office in the base of it and he had very few staff left, about two guys. And he wanted us to take them over and uh, and to go on with his practice. It seemed like a marvelous offer when we first um, came across it because what an introduction to so many people. But we decided that we couldn't live with him as a partner. It looked as if he would never want to get out. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he could only ever see things his way. 
Um, so, uh, well, he must have been quite a character. He was for Ian Fleming to call Gold, to name Goldfinger after him. So, uh, <laughs> whatever working relationship that would turn out to be. But he was uh, he, he was a nice guy. He was a nice guy, but I think very very narrow in his in in his vision of in his love of what he did actually you know you could see he would never let it go and, and he'd be in knocking on the office door every day um so that was that one other ways of building archigram talked about building did they not in their sort of repertoire building frames which people could inhabit and they uh I, I could only find this. I used to have their, their actual original publication, but I've lost it somewhere in transit. But they've still got good fundamental ideas there, some of which have been partly tried, but not yet tried, but might be worth bearing in mind when we do see what we want, because uh, the thing that interested me was uh, building frames which endured and which you then populated with individual fillings. And that, that struck me as an, an interesting idea. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I, there was sort of, there's that place, isn't there? It, it, uh, well, I don't know. It seemed to me that the, the frame would endure and that had an advantage in the next, generation of buildings we're coming to uh, with global warming where you don't throw away things you re-inhabit them and that reminded me of a, a, a study that the uh the the, the, the uh who am i trying to say uh lse did um with their a thing about the Torre David uh, in uh, Caracas, uh, where an unfinished Ministry of Finance building um, was uh, inhabited in a rogue way by uh, some citizens lacking homes in the centre of the city who wanted to be in the center of the city and wanted to have a home. And instead of going to the, the, the hovels on the outskirts, they, they populated the frame of this building and sort of finished it. And they had motorbikes running the shopping up to the top floor and things like that. And that informal community, it's politely called, endured uh, i don't know what the current situation was there, there was talk of uh, 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 rehousing them in some other way but i think they might still be going on um, anyway um, that suggested another way of doing things um, in, in a different form the biggest example i had of creating and i want here to relate the importance of value the biggest thing i ever did in anything like that kind of slightly esoteric connection was of course castle now in norwich um, where there were several attempts going on uh, to uh, build shopping malls on the edge of norwich which norwich did not want mm -hmm. an attempt to build one down by the station which wasn't quite so bad but was going to be bad as it was then seen for the city centre and it left what to do with the outer bailey of Norwich Castle in question. Well it took, I, I had no idea uh, of doing it, I'd never done a shopping centre before and we were a very small firm uh, but again I won't tell you the story of that now because that will be the rest of our discussion. You, you, you most of you know about it but uh, the tower cranes were there and it looked like a shipyard while it was being built for a number of years and we never closed a road while we did it uh, other than uh, to deflect it and I having been a royal engineer in my 
uh, National Service Days, was delighted to be the only on the guy on site who'd ever built a Bailey Bridge because we reconnected uh, the town to it uh, via Bailey Bridge. But it, it worked. And uh, again, if you look at my website, there's the beginnings of an account of that that will be filled out, I hope, over the years that shows that. But it got extremely good publicity and it got publicity because it was value for money, because a term I like to use and I've ever since liked to use, cost in use, was the equation that, that was accounted for. Uh, and cost in use seems to me more important than the cost of the building. I don't mean the cost of the building is not important, but the cost of a site, the cost of the de developer, the cost tax to the government and so on and so forth. You have to look holistically at the whole question of costs. And that's quite, a, well, to sort of jump in, that's quite an interesting thing to think about it in terms of use and how people use, people, how people use it and also why it's being used that you've spoken about a vast sort of time period in terms of your career and how that has changed from what seems like a, a sort of post-war utopian vision of everything's there in terms of benefit to um, the present day uh, post sort of Thatcherite Britain where everything is sort of much more commercial without um, the use for everybody else. And I wondered if you could sort of say something about how, how the sort of the time period has changed and also how, how the profession and the sort of society and the situation that you operate with it, within as an architect, how those two things are sort of related. I think uh, certainly they change very significantly uh, and any member of a profession is in an increasing difficulty, I think, in some ways. Um, there. Uh, and I do believe uh, what people uh, who are advocating this radical change to do away uh, or to make global warming tolerable, how they are saying, it's not my perception, but I can absolutely see the point, that we should not be making physical decisions to reshape major physical things that we can avoid at that the moment. It doesn't mean to say we mustn't make any decision. It doesn't mean to say that life can sit on our hands and do nothing. But you should be very careful and discreet about the decisions you do make. Yeah. Uh, because if they're wrong, they're just another load of money wasted that isn't going the right way. And, and also in today's context, you know, the the global deadline is 2030 it's you know, eight years away essentially and in terms of periods or projects that you know you would have worked on many that were longer than that so the idea of saying we don't need to know like we can't build on anything or we have to be sure that we're doing the right thing knowing what is the right thing is a very tricky situation to be in for us now in the sort of practice and just wider society today. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because again, if I can just refer to one aspect of Carlson Mao, um, he started accidentally, as far as I was concerned, as an exercise in, uh, in protest against a very bad scheme that was going to demolish, demolish uh, I think it was 36 listed buildings on Timber Hill, yeah. and it was part of the first definition of, of, of conservation areas in the city at a time when planning hadn't entirely lost its way, which I think it did subsequently go a long way in the wrong direction uh, because of lack of uh, central government motivation and resources, as with the hospital. It became about money things rather than real things. And I think uh, you have to say uh, that 
it took 20 years to bring about from the first spark of an idea. Um, and uh, I, I should say, I'll put the account of it, um, but you know, it, it took my firm uh, to Moscow because it looked so profitable in the end for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, the council uh, it, it got the castle greened, it got its car parking underground, it got its shopping underground and so on and so forth. Uh, not into all that, no, you all know it well pretty certainly. But I do want to just briefly allude to uh, the relationship to local government because Castle Mao came about because of the staunch support in the end of Norwich City Council. Uh, Patricia Hollis um, was as responsible for Castle Mao as I was. And it was interesting that she came from Plymouth too. <laughs> and she was not that much younger than me. And sadly, she's died since that, that's, uh, that's sad. Um, but uh, there we are. But you cannot divorce the ability of professionals to do things uh, from the politicians who have to make the environment within which they can do them. It's also important to remember that the professions started in the 19th century to, as it were, mediate between the unscrupulous contractor and uh, the public. And th that's not a role it's easy to fulfill unless the opportunity is there to do it. And uh, I think. Uh, I, 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 th I think the, uh, it used to be a community of interest. I mean, um, we used to have, uh, well, I don't know, just fun, really. Um, th th there was an architect's ball that we invented in the end that took place once a year. Um, that was great fun. And we used to take clients to it and take other professionals to it. And uh, oh, I, I, I sat at a an architect's ball table um, with uh, Colin Chapman, um, the chap who did Lotus Cars. Um, Colin was a difficult man and he wasn't my direct client, he was Chris's client, but I, I did the laminating shop as a result of that. We didn't go there to get a job, yeah. but it was part of the, uh, and the Strangers Club and things like that were part of that solicitors or the law society used to have a, a dinner once a year and, and so did other professions i think that was a very good thing so uh you're keeping active in the community well from a from the conversations we've had it seems intrinsic that as a practicing and successful architect you're active in sort of local politics and the local community. You're also uh, active in the local professional community, but there's um, an overriding sense of sort of commerce as a, a civic activity. People have jobs and roles, but it's, it's not purely driven by money and commercialism. There's a, there's a sort of a wider or greater purpose to it. Founding members of the Norwich Society included architects, the Lord Mayor of the day, and various other people of the day. And that relationship has continued to this day. And it's interesting, isn't it, uh, that if you go back uh, to the turn of the century, um, some of the best council housing was done in the worst slums of London. Yeah. And has never been improved upon. Uh, they, 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 they have to jealously guard them now, or they would all be privatized. It's also true that that time was the start of uh, the uh, Garden City. And I would commend to you um, what uh, uh, the Urban Design Group and uh, the Town and Country Planning Association are doing at the moment 
by way of speculating on what our ways of coping with the current situation, because everybody that is really serious about this, and that must be everybody but Johnson, I think, but <laughs> everybody that is serious about this thinks that this is a time for deciding what it is as best we can, and we can never look ahead indefinitely, um, what we should do to correct the situation that gives us the chance to look ahead further uh, than the end of this century. And I think that's interesting too, because um, I did have a book here, I can't see it quickly, but which was talking about our future in space. Well, we're never going to get into space other than for expensive joyriding unless we finish the job here on Earth properly and maintain our ability to live here. And I think at times, I mean, um, one of the very first uh, hyperbolic paraboloids um, that I came across uh, in practice was a timber hyperbolic paraboloid in Norfolk, um, which in Suffolk, I think it was, the egg packing station at Hawley. I can't remember it very clearly now, but that interested me in uh, hyperbolic paraboloids, if only in the name. Um, and uh, what was true was that Buckminster Fuller, who writes appallingly, uh, in terms of readability for me anyway, um, that he produced this uh, thing that chart that showed the rate of change. But more importantly, um, along with another uh, 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 person I've long admired, um, which was uh, the, uh, if I can see it, you see my, 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 it is going, oh yes, here it is, hiding in plain sight. The other guy I admired, uh, for slightly different reasons, was Vitruvius, uh, and his, uh, uh, he was, among other things, was writing about military engineering, and that, 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 that's what caught, first caught my eye, but he also writes a lot about building and common sense about building of facilities of the area and so on and so forth, and uh, I think that's interesting too. Um, well, where do we go? I think we notice that a scheme I did that never got built would probably have been in this country the most valuable scheme that I had any access to, which was in Dorking. Um, when I, uh, when local government changed last time, uh, it seemed to me a good thing and a bad thing happened. And one disgraceful thing was that uh, Norwich lost its status as an autonomous city. I think that's a huge mistake in administration and principle. And I think it was political reasons because the city and the county were ever, ever there and it was the county that were the, uh, the, the, the dominant government. I, I thought it was an appalling thing to do, um, but a good thing it did was give me a great job opportunity uh, because I had done some very early housing in Bolton uh, when nearly 50 years ago uh, and uh, I had noticed Taylor and Green and Taylor and Green did some of, still some of the finest housing ever, I think, as most of it is rural housing. And luckily for me, as I came out of the egg, um, they retired to Spain. And Lawton uh, District Council, which was a prime client of theirs, um, and uh, uh, at the time of local government reform, uh, had noticed that I had done some uh, housing in London of a very different sort, but can we just look at um, the odd slide of that? Um, because it's 
And I shan't go on much longer. We'll yeah, throw I think this we over. should um, yeah, open it up to the floor. Yeah, well, we can do that now if you like, uh, because both people are Taylor and Green. <laughs> there you are, that's Taylor and Green. So Taylor and Green in the country. I'll share this. There we go. Yeah. Now, can you look at the other ones in that group? Yes. Again, these are on my website. Um, this is Taylor and Green. Uh, let me just share this one as well. Yep. There we go. Now, can you see uh, Brundle there? Can you see? Yeah, and we can. That's my Norfolk interpretation many years ago uh, of uh, Taylor and Green. Um, didn't copy their detailing, didn't go for their barge, went for Norfolk clipped uh, ends, went for a very tall chimney pot, which was uh, more typical of that. And the windows at that time standard windows and this was a spec house built by the local builder which was another difference these things were done in groups done by locally. local builders yeah and uh the windows were a range that was a little improvement i don't know how much of an improvement but it was a little improvement because they had a good joint shop and they wanted to produce a standard window that wasn't a boatman and paul a boatman Paul at that time were everywhere with crummy uh, windows. There's another house type there of that one. It's just an, an odd one. Can you find it? Um, yes. Uh, there we are. That's the house. Again, more typically Norfolk, perhaps. But that was again. But it led me, because it got noticed in Bodden when they retired, it led me to build the South Norfolk District Council offices on local government the organization because they were a new second tier authority not just like that um, but it, it did was a direct part to it now that's another interesting thing because when we put the south norfolk district council offices in the country they were at first based on uh, standard span developers office but in the end we produced that double uh, hexagon mm -hmm. uh, arrangement with the council offices over that led uh, uh, to uh, uh, another council office. Uh, but that's interesting because when that was officially open, the bricklayers who built were somewhat convoluted brickwork actually came up while the, the Princess Royal, whoever she was, was there and said how much they'd enjoyed working on something it wasn't just boring old brick, you know? yeah. And that's another little factor. Very, very local. Um, I'm sort of conscious of time. You and your job. I think that we <laughs> should open it up for sort of questions or conversations from um, everybody who's here. So if you imagine we were in a, uh, a pub or the Madden Market or something like that, you know, are there any questions or any topics that anybody would like to raise um, with Mike? There's a hell of a lot of experience and just from spending a couple of hours with you, you've pretty much got an informed decision on, uh, or an informed opinion on anything. <laughs> so there's always something new that comes up. I think what I find interesting from talking to you is the um, organization of people and being part of the community and how that is somehow linked to, it must be linked to the solution to our current climate crisis. And that um, as an ex one thing I have in the back of my mind is that you talk about uh, post-war, sort of the situation and society post-war and it's after the disaster. And we're, if you read the news, we're heading towards a disaster. Um, 
do we need to wait for that disaster or do we address it or how do we you know how do we do that how do we organize people and I, that's the kind of that's more a subject um but that's the kind of interesting thing that you reacted to a disaster in the sense of the second world war and we've got one in front of us and do we do we have to get there before things change or do you think we can turn it around before history would suggest that you wait for disaster <laughs> right. i hope this is one without pressure yeah well see you in eight years um <laughs> we've got we've got a question here uh, from john asking about the model in the foreground do you want to talk us through oh lord yes the, uh, the dorking scene <laughs> oh yes this is dorking and what you can't see Behind the camera is uh, Mike's studio and house full of models that he's made for schemes all around the UK. This is an alternative way uh, to creating density uh, that is based on my experience. And it, it consists of layers piled on top of an existing scruffy car park alongside an existing small shopping centre and putting a supermarket in the middle of very upmarket Dorking and creating enormous value in the middle of very upmarket Dorking. Now, if you leave that to the usual rules, it, of course, uh, becomes, uh, well, subject to the usual extortion of maximum profit, if you're not careful, by the usual developer mentality. But in my mind, uh, developers are what politicians and financial people make them and you can convert that like tomorrow. So much money is taken out and stuffed offshore and stuffed anywhere but into the place that rather more should be kept for the place as well as uh, the proper uh, charge that should be made to the users of the building. Um, can we, uh, I, I, I won't take the pieces <laughs> because this is no place to explain, but here is uh, a rejected layer of that which uh, begins to show you, and again I won't deal with it here, but it's a mix of housing, it's a supermarket, it's a green roof with a walk over it, it's uh, an infant school in a safe place on the roof above a public library uh, on which the children can play away from the street in a supervised way and so on. So you get the general idea. And I mean, in terms of commissioning a scheme, who, I mean, using that as an example for the project, who was commissioning that? Because it's, it's got the, uh, the Mike Innes extra factor so you're you have scruples just sort of drawing on something you said earlier so you've got a kind of a, um your own personal drive to make places as good as you can you know that it's a successful uh shopping center but there are also residential and school and like social factors that go with it who's the client the in client. that situation what? and are they asking for it as well or are you just push are you pushing it uh, they wanted, uh, the, the, the requirement was uh, more shopping in the supermarket, not a mall, right. nothing like that at all. Um, there was also undoubtedly a local authority that wanted a library. Um, so that was a factor. I had done, and they had could see the uh, Dorking offices of that council, Mole Valley District Council. It's alongside the road. It followed on South Norfolk Council. Uh, and uh, again, localism. I was struck by the fact that uh, the same brick uh, clay strata runs from East Anglia through to that part of the world. Yeah. Um, and um, I had said something of this uh, in the um, Architect Journal report uh, on, on South Norfolk District Council. And that put me on a long list of 100 architects and Mole Valley, who was a stockbroker, Belt and all that, um, went round 
uh, and they actually <laughs> did actually talk um, to the best part of those people and they reduced it to a list of six and I produced and there's a good good point here I mean this remember this was in the days before computing uh, uh, this uh, and uh, sitting in my office here and I can't show it to you is what I did which was to put uh, the, 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 the new offices they wanted having been impressed with South Norfolk District Council offices uh, on the other part of the site than that indicated in the competition conditions, uh, because I thought it was a better place to put it as a screen to Pitbrook, uh, which was a sunken part relative to entrance to walking, and put the council offices on the roof and so on. Again, um, you'll see it on my website if you want to look at it, but uh, it, uh, it, it was fun to do. And that led to the conversation with the developer. And the developer who uh, actually resulted in my doing the thing actually wanted to do it, but he had a change of management back at the base and whoever was putting money into that development company um, thought it would take too long. Yeah. <laughs> so. So it's driven, yeah. So driven by money. Right. But not, not even given a window of opportunity unless it produced the money. And it did produce the money yeah. in terms, of, it's just no chap didn't want to take that much risk. Not, not because of money risk, but time. Yeah, there are other things. Interesting. The old, the old factors, time and money. Um, we've got another question here from Simon. He says, uh, thinking more carefully about what we build and why we build seems key to one strand of this climate emergency, but it seems our leaders are not in contact with what intelligence and the professions can offer on this difficult topic. What should the professions be doing to get their heads together and what relationship should they be seeking with national government? Well, uh, I haven't made them all that clearly, but making, uh, making these sort of arguments about cost in use uh, and uh, accepting the fact that to uh, take so much money out all the time uh, is, is dishonest. I think governments have been dishonest uh, in, with increasing intensity since the 50s. Um, why do you think? Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because of uh, the way way money is managed uh, nationally. Uh, I don't know. I'm 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 conscious of money, but but you know, it's the business of huge profits, uh, huge bonuses for not even the guy providing the funds. Uh, bank it, it, it's to do with the backup people uh i don't know i don't know i'm not the man to ask about mechanics of money other than as applied mechanics i'm an applied mechanic when it comes to money yeah as and an architect as an architect yeah. yeah interesting um it's one thing that is not taught um in the architectural education you know, i've always finance and money it's not it's not even taught in schools it's a very yeah, a huge gap missing i think in general education and mm -hmm. um, we've got another question here from james um who says hello do you mike innes have any thoughts on the east norwich master plan currently in development or any other buildings in norwich and how would you encourage developers to maintain historic sites and buildings at carrow works and trouse for example and how would you resolve the typical conflict between conservation and development and local communities? And how would you encourage the greater use of design? <laughs> Over to you. There is, no, there is no better way of encouraging uh, good design than doing good design. Uh, people like, like, like to be 
uh, right to have their projects praised, and provided it doesn't cost them too much, yeah. um, they're willing to do that. Uh, the answer is, uh, uh, what do I think of the current? I think it's disgraceful that we're producing proposals to amalgamate the Broadland and, uh, uh, and South Norfolk district as one, when the only reason for that really is the lack of a sound grasp of a sound policy. Uh, and to put it on, uh, as it were, a business park for its new headquarters in the old uh, insurance uh, thing there, I think is, is even more demoting in a way, uh, because uh, one of the first things that uh, certainly South Norfolk wanted to do was to get out of Norwich. It wanted it, and if you look at Long Stratton, it's at the geographical center of its district. And I'm, I'm amazed. And I, I think we, they can only do it under jurists. On the other hand, um, they both probably got offices which are too big for each of them with the way money has been taken out of local government. And I think money should be put back into local government uh, with a very full brief as to how the country is going to reorganize, uh, not put back, but deal with better um, its economy in a, in, in a different way uh, and in a post uh, COVID. And, I mean, we, we're, we're specialized here, aren't we, in, 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 in pandemics, uh, but for turkeys, basically, um, my time was occupied with turkey pandemics, Bernard Matthews, um, and, and citing them uh, on, uh, on, 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 on the state, uh, on old airfields. But it was interesting that one of the reasons for uh, the size of one department of South North in those days uh, was its public health department to deal with that, um, these, these plagues and things. Well, you know, if we've got COVID and things like that with us, shouldn't we be dealing with public health on a more local basis again, properly, instead of passing it on? Shouldn't we be doing the same thing with education? Shouldn't we be pulling back um, some of the industries, small industries probably, uh, to begin with, that uh, uh, are needed still? because they now can send uh, the ability to print them down wires um, and we can have local employment again mm -hmm. and it can even go down. I mean, I'm terrified of the disconnect that could come with uh, sending everything down a wire. Have you ever tried to miscorrect a, 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 I, I don't know, a British gas mistake, which I've been doing recently, it's, it, it's so frustrating, it's just not true, um, to get hold of the right person, you know? Well, imagine democracy in an age when uh, there is a formula online for dealing with everything. Yeah, that's interesting. I think, I mean, as a format, um, this is clearly where the lecture should conclude and then immediately go to the nearest pub. <laughs> and continue for several hours um, and I think I don't know we'll see uh, what what the kind of demand or feedback feedback is like in terms of meeting up for debates because it's something that's been missing over the last year and a half with zoom presentations where it's just uh, watching lectures actually getting involved in the conversation that might just be the thing that helps um, I don't know bring things around in the next few years um, so if there aren't any more questions, uh, which I don't think there are, but unless somebody would like to ask it in person by turning their mic and uh, camera on, um, I'd just like to thank you, Mike, <laughs> for that, yeah, for always being a sort of an informed, uh, wise elder to the sort of local community and for, yeah, just sort of pro provoking and raising, you know, raising queries. Eat every sentence you can have a, an entire evening's session on it. And so it might be that there's a series, maybe we'll get uh, BBC Norfolk in. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, and so I think, um, yeah, I think I would like to conclude it. Right, would you like to say something about the model? <laughs> well, I just I forgot to mention uh, this, of course, is, is, is again a product of um, the NAA. And I'm sorry we dropped NAA, by the way. I know <laughs> in the interest of centralization, uniformity, and establishing wider credentials, it's a good thing to do. For me, it's a bad thing to do. Uh, not appalling. We were never known or recognized as other than part of the uh, RIBA and never thought of ourselves as other. But it is a pity, it's another thing gone to a centre. But no, I did want to point to this because this is a model of the thing that you can get a copy of online uh, 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 about uh, development in Norfolk. You can, you can, you can download this um, in Do Different and Do Better. And you've already paid for it because that was an exhibition uh, published. Uh, that, uh, that was a paper of mine published uh, back in 2012 um, by the Norfolk Association of Architects. It's yours. All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining in as well. Um, we've got another talk in a couple of weeks on the 24th and it's uh, past presidents featuring yourself. Uh, but me, I would be a minor bit. <laughs> I would be listening to what the other presidents say. Uh, along with uh, others, including Dream, we've got uh, Anthony Hudson, uh, John Boone, uh, Chris Garner as well. So um, that'll be more thoughts from more kind of uh, experienced locals. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Hope to see you there. And um, there will be a lineup of events in the spring um, with the sort of postponement of fan 21 it'll move over into uh, 2022 so hopefully we can see you then and um meet in person yes that would be nice all right thank you thanks everybody <laughs>